Hi guys and welcome to the first video in a series of how to create games with Coco Sharp Framework and Visual Studio. So why do you want to create a game? It's definitely good programming practice if you're new to programming to start with something quite simple like a 2D game. You can learn lots of things that you wouldn't necessarily get to play on things like web applications or normal desktop applications. So you're looking at graphics at a really deep level and not just the visual part of graphics, but also the way that they move or interact or the maths and physics behind that as well. You get sometimes to really work at performance and, and identifying why it is that your game might not be performing as well as it should be, and then actually working out how to optimize those things. And also you get to think about bigger issues like playability. How is my game going to be seen by people? How am I going to market it? How am I going to build a story or a loyal fan base behind the game? And one thing that can be really fun is you can involve friends who are not programmers to help you on the game. So if you know somebody who's a designer, why not get them to help you with the graphics or somebody else who's maybe a musician, get them to do some sound effects for you. And of course, the, the kind of li limits are endless there. You can get a whole group of friends just to spend a lot of time together, hang out and at the same time make something that's both fun and potentially can make some money as well. And if we actually kind of asked the question initially, though, and this is kind of my main reason for starting this series, is that so many options available for actually asking the question of how I go about writing a game. So you can choose a platform, a framework that, sorry, that's locked to a single platform. Let's say a framework that only works on Macs or framework that only works on Windows. And you can get something that's pretty high performance, but at the same time, it's not necessarily going to give you the maximum market for your game. Because ideally, if you can have a cross-platform game, then you get something that's going to sell potentially to a lot more devices and a lot more places. You've also got the choice of going for 3D. So some of the most amazing games that you've seen, Call of Duty, those sorts of things, they're all very 3D. But of course, they take an absolute age, a ton of money and lots of people to program because as soon as you go 3D, there's so much more that you need to consider. So that can be difficult. And it's why we're looking at 2D games in the first place. But 2D games will give you enough kind of understanding and knowledge to then move into 3D games if you so want to. You've got a choice of picking something in, la in a language that you already know. So a programming language, if you know C Sharp, if you know Objective C, if you know C++, there's going to be a framework that kind of suits what you already understand. And you mustn't underestimate how useful that is because there's nothing worse than spending ages sc scratching your head looking at code that you don't really understand. Whereas when it's in a, a dialect that you're used to, you just see it, you read it, you know exactly what's going on. It just saves you a ton of time. So really, we want to kind of go cross-platform here. We're saying, well, if we go cross-platform, we've got a choice of a number of frameworks. Some are quite mature. Some are nice to use. Other, others are perhaps less specialist for games work. And therefore, they might be usable for games, but they're not really famous for it. So I was reading earlier that there's a framework called QT, which is a very famous cross-platform framework that uses C++. And although apparently it's very, very good for games, because it's not known for being used for games, you won't find very much information about how to write games in QT, even if it's possible. At the same time, if you're very familiar with QT and very familiar with C++, maybe that's a good choice. But, you know, at every point you're going to potentially find something that's not going to be quite as good as a game specific framework. So why Coco Sharp of all the ones? Why have I chosen that? It's based on a very mature gaming framework called Coco 2D, which was originally in a Mac program or a Mac framework, which then got ported to C++, got ported to C Sharp under Microsoft XNA, which was an old kind of gaming framework that never really took off. And now that's kind of been replaced with Mono Game. So Mono Game is kind of a new game and engine designed for .NET. And so Coco Sharp is really taking the, the good bits of Coco 2D from the original framework and putting them into the .NET world. So that's pretty cool. It's 2D. Like I said, that's easier to begin with. Lots of examples and experience. So if I want to know how to scroll a map, I'm going to be able to find somebody scrolling a map in Coco 2D. 
And even if it's not in the right language, I can probably work out what I'll need to do to port it to C Sharp. It's a specialist game engine, so that's going to make your life easier. There's going to be certain abstractions, which then mean, you know, if you've got a layer or an object or a sprite or a collision, there are things that don't necessarily exist in other types of programs. And therefore, rather than writing them yourself, it's nice when a specialist game engine gives you those abstractions for free and just makes a lot of the common stuff that you're going to do work out of the box without having to write too much code. Uh, another reason for me, I'm very much a C Sharp programmer. I've, I know several other, other programming languages. C Sharp's definitely my main one. So a framework's written in C Sharp's very helpful for me, which is nice. And the kind of improved abstraction, something to be aware of is that Coco Sharp has been changed slightly from the C Sharp version of Coco 2D. And it was because the people who ported it kind of said, well, if we're going to do all this work to port it, let's actually fix some of these things that are a little bit clunky, don't work very well in the .NET world. They're not going to be very easy for .NET people to understand. Let's fix those. So there are going to be some differences. You might find code, of, say, from Coco 2D to do something. And then when you try and do it, you say, oh, these classes, they don't exist here or that, that method doesn't exist for some reason. So there's a big list of differences or key differences on the Coco Sharp website to just be aware of. But you'll probably have to deal with those as you come to them. And being a .NET framework many of the idioms you're used to like event-based programming and you know async and all that kind of stuff's all there and available in coco shop a couple of just warnings before you kind of go and you know quit your job and you know leave your family and all the rest of it to become a multi-millionaire if you're doing this for a hobby great or you just want to learn to do it maybe because you're interested great if you're taking a seriously be aware that developing games is hard for lots of reasons. It does take a long time um, and making money from games is very, very hard. I, and I've known people who've worked for professional game companies who've literally spent six months producing a game and not even a, a very complicated game. And then it gets towards launch and then somebody else has released a very similar game and then they just scrap the whole thing. So it's a very competitive market. It's probably relatively easy to make some money as long as you're making something that's quite original, but it's probably not going to pay your bills just yet unless you get really, really into it or you're like a kind of angry birds and, you know, whatever it is and, and you just happen to hit a sweet spot. Be aware there's lots of graphics to design. You can get graphics for free off the internet. You can get ones that are even licensed for free off the internet. So just be a bit careful of what graphics you use. Again, if you're doing this for a hobby, then you might as well just do that. Grab someone else's graphics. They've done all the hard work for you, or at least start with that. And then perhaps replace some of those graphics over time with your own graphics. But if you're going to do this seriously, if you're going to want to make money and want to make something original, you either are going to have to spend a lot of time doing those graphics and it's not easy. When, and we'll see later on why that's not so easy or even paying somebody to do it. If somebody else has already knows how to do it, it's probably going to be much quicker and cheaper in the long run just to do that. Remember that the mechanics of the software itself are fairly straightforward. The gameplay is the hardest bit by far of developing a game. So any of us can sit down and make a, you know, a cheap knockoff of Arkanoid or something. That's not difficult. It's fun. And we might kind of say, well, OK, we've done that. We're not going to make any money from a game that's a direct copy of something else. But if we want to make something really good and we want to be successful, then we're going to have to really think about the gameplay. How can we do something in a way that's not quite been done before? Maybe because it's very complex, maybe because it's very simple, but whatever, that's the bit that demands the most thought. And another kind of quick gotcha is there are some bugs and out-of-date tooling for Coco Sharp. Part of this, I think, is because the Windows phone SDK is now no longer maintained because there aren't any Windows phones anymore. So the latest versions of Visual Studio don't support Windows Phone, which means some of the templates and stuff don't work very well in 2017. Bit of a pain. That's just how it is. 
And before we go through the kind of setup of Visual Studio and how we actually get started, I'm assuming that you already know C Sharp and Visual Studio pretty well. So I'm not going to explain what I'm doing in C Sharp or Visual Studio. I'm just going to do it. I also understand that you have some basic understanding of maths and physics. So you think like gravity might be relevant. You might not have it in your game. But in some of the examples, we might see gravity in play. We might see the idea of acceleration. So when something moves, it doesn't go from zero to maximum speed immediately. It might speed up slowly. That's acceleration. So you don't need to know much about it, but just understand what those things are. So when we talk about it, hopefully the code will make sense. And obviously you're going to need access to a machine running Visual Studio which possibly kind of goes without saying. So let's have a look. Right. If you've installed Visual Studio 2017, you will have seen this kind of installer when you first installed it. And you can bring it up again from the control panel by going to programs and features, click on it, click change, and that will bring this up. I'm not quite sure why my arrow is flashing, but there you go. And the thing that you need to make sure that you've installed here is mobile development with .NET. So this is the Xamarin code. Now Xamarin, if you haven't seen it before, was originally a separate company and they worked out how to build cross-platform software. So cross-platform, mainly mobile, iOS, Android, Windows Phone, but using a lot of shared code and using C Sharp as the main language. So up until that point, most cross-platform stuff had been HTML based, didn't really perform very well. So Xamarin came along and they kind of made these kind of libraries and templates and stuff. Then Microsoft bought Xamarin. So this is now included in Visual Studio. This is the community edition. So it's even available in community. Make sure you tick that um, and install it. Obviously, I've already done that. That's the first thing you need to do. And then the second thing you need to do is you need to get hold of these Cocoa Sharp templates. And unfortunately, it's not a two second job. It's not too difficult. But if you search for installing Cocoa Sharp Visual Studio, you'll probably find this post on the Xamarin Forums site. And it's not massively complicated, but effectively, in order to install the extension, you need to add another extension gallery. So if we go back to Visual Studio, if we go to Tools, Options, Extensions and Updates, you'll need to add. So this is blank by default because this is additional ones. Uh, you need to hit add, which puts a line item in there. You'll then need to modify these and apply to make them update. Mobile Essentials is just the name for it. It doesn't really matter what you call it. And then HTTP gallery mobile essentials .org, feed .atom. And then once you've done that, when you then go into tools, extensions and updates and you search for Cocoa Sharp templates, then it will find that one there. It's got a little coconut on there. So you install that. If you're using 2017, you will get an error or a warning that says this isn't designed for 2017. You don't really have a lot of choice at the minute. There isn't a newer version of it. You'll have to install it. I don't think it's done anything bad to my Visual Studio. The only problem is, as we'll see in a minute, that missing project template for Windows Phone means that you'll get an error every time you create a cross-platform game which is nice. If you're using Visual Studio 2015, it should all work as normal, but I'm not sure how long Microsoft will support 2015 for or whether you can even still download it. But if you've already got 2015, it'll be easier just to do that anyway. And so that brings us here to Visual Studio to kind of create a new project. We're not going to do anything more in this video. We're just going to kind of look at how we create the basic uh, structure. Now, first thing I want to kind of say is really this is a video about or a video series about producing games. It's not particularly a video about doing cross platform stuff, but I am going to show you both. But just so you know, it is okay when you're first developing your game just to start with, say, an Android one and click OK. And what it will do is it will create you a single project here. And it'll give you all the, the relevant stuff you need to do. Cocoa Sharp uh, Game 3. And it's fine just for you to develop one platform. And then at a later date, 
you could then bring in the shared project and copy some of the stuff into the shared project. So you can do it that way around. And that obviously enables you to concentrate much more on just getting something working, even if you just get it very, very rough and get the basic gameplay working. And then you might say, right, now that we've got this, let's go back and create it from scratch. So that's one way you can do it. The other way you can do it is if you go to mobile and go to shared, you can click an empty game mobile and hit OK again. So this is the area you'll get in Visual Studio 2017. Basically means Windows Phone 8.1 CS project. Um, it's not going to work. There's nothing you can do about that, which is annoying, but there you go. And it will create you a shared project, an Android project, and an iPhone project. Now, this is kind of OK because it's already done some of the separation and the sharing for you. The only issue you've now got is if you start, say, putting assets in here and you start putting fonts and sounds and graphics and all the rest of it, you're going to have to make sure that you also do the same in here for iOS. Otherwise, you're going to end up with one that works and one that doesn't. So whether you think it's a good idea or not, what you could do is you could actually delete the iOS one if you wanted to and just have Android and shared. So then you can build up the shared stuff in here and then add iOS later. It's kind of up to you. I'm not going to talk much about cross-platform stuff. I'm going to mention it where it's relevant, but for the most part, you develop the game in the same way. Now, if you notice by default, the Android one is highlighted. That means if I try and hit start, it's going to attempt to debug this default Android game. So what I want to show you what actually happens when you first do it, because it's really confusing and it's a bit annoying because you just want it to work. You hit start. Now, if you build the project, it will build fine. But if you try and start it like this, it's actually got to do the download all the new get packages and everything else. It will come up with this error. There were deployment errors. Continue. Well, you can't really continue because it won't work. If you go to the output, now bearing in mind it might drop back to the error list. So go to the output tab and you'll see here er, somewhere or other, please select a valid device before running the application. So you go, well, you know, where do I get my valid devices from? Well, if you notice here, this is the Android toolbar. If you haven't got it, right click the gray area here and tick Android. And if you open the Android Device Manager, you, you've actually you will have one of these for free. It will have created you a virtual machine already. Now you can create a load of these if you want to test different devices and screen sizes and APIs, all the rest of it. That's kind of probably for later on. But it's created me one of those. But for some reason, if I hit that little arrow here, it thinks that device is unsupported. So that seems strange. So let's choose it anyway. And it's now going to give me an error saying, well, I can't use that virtual machine. Why? Because the device at API 27 is less than the minimum Android version in this project. And you think, oh, that's a bit weird. So you hit change it. But if you look here at the Android manifest, there is no Android manifest. So if I click that and I try and start it again, so it's still telling me it can't do it. I hit change and it's saying, well, it's used the latest. So it's a kind of a misleading error message. All you have to do is you have to go into Android Manifest. It says there isn't one. Click to add one. And Android Manifest on Android phones is, if you were programming this in a, a normal environment, is an XML file that describes uh, a various assets, uh, various factors. What am I talking about? Various uh, parameters of the application. So for instance, what's the minimum version? So if I set this minimum version to, let's say, you know, Android 5, that means if somebody tries to run my game on an earlier one, it won't work. So the App Store won't show it to you. And if you try and install it and run it, it will just say no, because it's the wrong minimum version. And you can use the SDK version here. We've got the SDK installed. Um, and if you want to know about SDKs, you open the Android SDK manager. And again, I think it installed uh, 27, the newest one by default. And then I installed um, one other when I was using my own device because it had a different API version. But again, you can tick 
whichever of these you want. Notice it downloads them to here. And just a warning is this folder can get really, really big. I think mine's about two gig at the minute just from SDKs and stuff. So if you back up your computer, I would exclude that folder because you could download these again later on. So anyway, now I've got my manifest. Uh, notice now that this is highlighted. And if I now click it, I'm going to get a different error. What's it going to say here? It's basically going to say, I can't start the virtual machine. So error again. No, I don't know why it can't start the Android virtual machine, but it can't by default. So if we hit the, uh, the Android device manager, so these are devices rather than SDKs. If I click start here, this is going to start up my emulator. I can close this now. And now that that's running, if I now click play, somehow it can find it now. So even though it can't start it, it can find it once it's running. And that's now worked out what the target version of uh, Android is. It's using the Java build tools, all the rest of it, to actually build a, a Java-based application. It's now uploading the game. That's the splash screen for the game. And then that's it. That is the Android application, which is absolutely rubbish. But that's kind of, you know, just you need to kind of do this bit first to work out that you've got everything set up correctly. If you can get this far, then you're laughing because from now on, all you're now doing is changing code and recompiling. So the first thing to notice, um, which will just show you how we would change it, is that this is in landscape rather than portrait. And we probably don't want that. So the first thing that I'm going to look at in a bit is um, maybe a bat and ball game, a bit like Arkanoid. So we're going to want this to be in portrait. So don't close this because if you close it, it takes ages to close and then sometimes ages to open. So just stop debugging here, Visual Studio, leave that running. And if we go to our program, so the things that are inside the Android specific project generally are the android specific attributes so these only apply to android and that's just because things like launch modes well they're specific to android because ios doesn't have a launch mode it might have something similar or different so you can't really abstract these away so the things that are specific to android are in the android project and resources are handled differently on ios android and windows so each of them will have their own way of laying resources out and in some cases will have different formats of them but apart from those things most of the rest of everything you're going to do will be in the shared project and that's what makes it really cool because then that code gets shared between ios android and windows and then you only have to do a little bit of fiddling to make it work now in the android program here we can see that screen orientation says sensor landscape and sensor landscape i think means it will start in landscape unless the sensor says it's the other way around. But we're going to say, no, I don't really want that. I want portrait. So let's set it to portrait. And then all I'm going to do is hit F5 again. So I've only made one change. And now if we go, well, that just came to the foreground automatically. Now it's going to run that. And with any luck, it's going to be up the right way. Obviously, that now doesn't look very nice, but we can worry about that later. And now it's in portrait. Now the screen size is all wrong, um, and that's for that's because of a different reason. That's because in here we actually set things like desired width, desired height, all the rest of it. So actually, if we're saying, well, if this is going to be the other way around, probably want that 10, 24, 7, 6, 8. We won't worry too much about um, about numbers for now because we'll look at that as we start developing the game. But now that we've done that, hopefully that screen will now be the other way around. And it will look a bit more like a bit more like a full screen. Now, 1024 by 768 is actually four by three. And this will be a 16 by nine phone. That's why it doesn't quite fill the screen. But we don't really care about that. So we've got that working. That's ready to go. We now need to kind of ask some really basic questions about what it is that we're trying to do. And this is what we're going to start looking at in the next videos. But let's just have a think about if I can find my downloads. If I just click here and look at large icons. So I picked some examples of some games to give you ideas in, in terms of 2D games about what it is that you're actually trying to do. So 
if you think of Pac-Man, so most of you have probably seen Pac-Man. You might not be old enough to have ever played it. But Pac-Man was basically a static screen like this. So the screen layout never changed. You're Pac-Man, so you're this, this little circle with a mouth on it. And your job is to go around and eat all of these little dots. Once you've cleared them all, then you finish the screen. And then exactly the same screen comes up again and you carry on. So that's basically the game. These ghosts move around uh, and if they touch you, you'll die. So you've got to try and avoid them whilst eating all these little dots. If you eat the big dots, then all the ghosts basically become vulnerable and you can eat them. And then if you eat them, they'll go back to here and have to come out again in, in the, um, afterwards. So it's a pretty static kind of game. And if you think about it, well, there aren't really many elements here. You have kind of visual things. So you've got a black background and obviously that's a background. It has no meaning other than it's just black. So if it was red, it wouldn't make any difference to anything. So there's a kind of background elements. You then have what we might call terrain elements. So all of these lines here are terrain and they're terrain because they will affect where the Pac-Man can move and where he can't move. So he can't cut across there because that's terrain, but he can go anywhere where these dots are. So terrain is kind of a key concept in, in any game, whether you're using a kind of scrolling map or anything else. You're, you're almost always going to have something that prevents you from going wherever you want to go. So it, it might stop you going out the edge. It might not stop you, you know. So terrain is another thing. And in this case, because this is such an old game and it would have been written on a, a machine with very little memory, it almost certainly wouldn't have been done uh, in any particularly complicated way. These would have been drawn as some kind of probably highly efficient just list of, of elements. Maybe it was uh, vectors that just said join a dot from there to there to there to there, whatever. And then there would have had to have been some maths involved which says, well, what's the current position of Pac-Man? If you tell it to go left, it's going to have to do a quick check to say, well, am I allowed to go left or is there terrain to my left? In which case you can't. You'll just carry on going in the same direction. So... The collision detection between the sprite and the terrain would have been done by hand. In new stuff, when we look at the tiled games later on, some of that's done for you automatically, which is great because it saves a lot of time rather than you having to, to define this all yourself. But this is an old game, would have been done that way. And then, of course, you have effectively your entities, which are like your player, your enemies, your food, your you know, anything that you interact with. And in some ways, that some of those things move, some of them don't move, some will move under the control of the user, some will move under the control of the computer, some of them like these dots obviously don't move, but when you eat them, they disappear like that, so that's why there's nothing in that bit there. So again, in this kind of era of games, they would have programmed that probably all manually, they would have just had a big list, big collection of um, of dots and where they were, and then for every time Pac-Man goes to a new position, the game clock would have said, right, what position are you, if you're there and you're not dead, then the dot that was there is not there anymore, it will put your score up, and then you can carry on. So this is kind of a, a game that even today you could design this game just with st with um, hard coded graphics you could hard code these walls you could hard code the positions of the dots you wouldn't need to use any special tooling but you could do if you wanted to so you know this is kind of one example of uh, an old game and then something that we, we all have a little play at is kind of an arkanoid style game so this is something that many of us wasted many many hours on so it's basically a bat and ball game if you haven't seen it before. Uh, the ball, if the ball goes down here past the bat, then you lose a life. And it's your job to keep batting the ball up. And as the ball hits these blocks, they disappear. And then eventually, once you've got rid of all the blocks, then you finish the round and you go up to the next level. The ones that I remember playing with are um, you, you used to get like kind of little gifts that dropped down from some of these blocks that maybe made the bat wider or narrower or it made the bat sticky so the ball didn't bounce, it just stopped. Now this is actually pretty straightforward to do in a 2D game so we're going to do that probably as our first kind of example and again the point here is because we haven't got any scrolling maps, this is literally a static area, there isn't much need to bring in anything other than a couple of basic graphics which we can tile over the background, a couple of these which are 
exactly the same box with different colors in. So again, we can do that in a number of different ways. We can use a graphic or we can actually build this up individually. And then we can show how things like how you move a bat with the, the cursor or the mouse, how the balls bounce and, and everything else. Pretty straightforward to do. Again, don't really need much tooling. So that's kind of a similar type of game to Pac-Man in that it's static and it just have, has a few things moving on it. But then you've got things like um, Manic Miner. So Manic Miner has, I can't remember, it had something like 20 levels. And it's very, very old games made in like the early 80s. And this was like level one. And you're basically the Manic Miner and your job's to kind of jump around here, go along here, collect all the keys. And then once you collected the keys, you then have to come all the way back and find the exit door, which I think is over here somewhere. And so although there were 20 rooms, again, they're kind of almost like 20 individual screens. So actually, you wouldn't really need to map these out on a mapping tool like we would with a tiled game, which we'll see later. We'd probably just code it 20 different screens with 20 different bits of metadata and say, right, once you get to level two, draw the keys in a different place, draw some different types of lines and stuff like that. So really, that's kind of similar to Pac-Man and Arkanoid, just multiplied 20 times. Obviously, if there were 200 levels, you wouldn't really want to do it like that because you'd have a lot of duplication and a, and a lot of memory wasted. But for 10, 20 levels, you could kind of get away with that without using up too much stuff. Then you had the kind of the scrolly game. So this is Defender. And again, even though it's an old game, effectively... This is quite kind of advanced, really. That white box there shows you the viewport of the entire level. So if you fly your kind of spaceship that way, the viewport moves. I think it, um, it loops around. I think you go back to the other side if you go out, but I can't quite remember. And the thing here is, although this is scrolling, really the scrolling is only a perception thing. At the end of the day, this is just a line that's been kind of calculated. It might even be random. I'm not sure. And all, all that happens is as you scroll, it moves that line across. So again, it's a perception of a 2D movement. But really, it's just saying, well, if the spaceship goes that way, move everything that way on the screen. And then obviously, if they go off the edge of the screen, they're invisible. And that makes it look like you're moving. So... Sometimes when you're writing a game, you're using visual trickery to produce a perception of movement when, in fact, all you've actually got is a black screen and a spaceship that kind of moves within that kind of area of the screen and then makes everything else move to look like you're moving. Same with BMX racers. This was an old Commodore game. That's you on a BMX. And what happens is that the screen scrolls downwards and you as the bike you've got to stay on the road and of course the road twists and it turns and you you know got to make sure you don't crash if you go off the road you die and then you, you start again so again it's kind of there are a couple of different ways you could do this but it's unlikely in this era that they drew a really big long map and made it scroll down almost certainly they would have generated this using mathematics and it did show the same roads every time you played it so those numbers were deterministic they weren't random but it probably would have said right depending on what number it is maybe it just draws the path as it's going along these are just randomly kind of shown just for a laugh so again you can decide when you do your game whether you want to mimic movement by just scrolling items down the screen or whether you actually want to generate a map and this is effectively a viewport on the map and the viewport moves as the user moves and it will there's no right answer to that it will depend on on how big the game is and how complex and then the last one i kind of want to look at is this kind of introduces the idea of a tiled game so most of you will know super mario land so it's one certainly well possibly one of the first famous very obviously tile 2d games so as you can see here every single one of these squares is the same and even if you look at the pipe you see well that square is the same as that square is the same as that square then there's a square with a line in it and then there's a square at the bottom so there's probably only about you know four different types of tiles to make up any size of pipe and then ones for kind of pipes at the top and pipes at the bottom and then you've got things like, you know, your mushrooms and your tortoises and your square boxes. So effectively, the tiled map game says, well, I'm going to have a grid of tiles, maybe 
30 or 40 different tiles and then I'm going to design the map to place these tiles wherever I feel like placing them so every level can be a bit different but they're all based on the same basic attributes I could make the background different so I could make it nighttime on the next level but otherwise use the same boxes for everything else and then the game's job is really just to interpret that map and to say, right, well, when I read this map in, I know that these are things that Mario can walk on. But I know that if he jumps onto a pipe, he's going to go down to another level. It, the tortoise moves, so that's not static. The mushrooms move. Um, you know, if he bounces on these, they need to do something. So the tiled game is quite flexible and can offer you a massive amount of variation for not very much memory and CPU usage, which is why it's a really, really popular choice for 2D games. And I'd say that in most cases, if you have anything that looks remotely like a scrolling game like this, then probably the easiest way for you to do it is with a tile map, which we'll look at in a later video. And just in case you're interested, there's an example of a little tile map that I found online. So this is what it actually looks like. Obviously, in real life, they don't get laid out like this. But this just says, well, I can pick that one and I can have that one and that one. I can have three of those in a row, do whatever onto a larger map. So these, as long as I've got every single individual element on here, I can then place them as I want to place them to design my big levels. So what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to look a little bit at the structure of the Android application and we're going to start building up a kind of an Arkanoid style bouncing ball game. And that's not because I'm super clever, but just so that you know, if you go to um, github.com slash mono slash Coco Sharp, and remember it's got two S's in the middle, then if you go to the wiki, you'll see here that there are samples and on the samples page, there's, you know, random things in here. It's got the bouncy ball stuff. It's got um, Scone Bananas is a big walkthrough and stuff like that. But also, if you look at, uh, if you search for uh, Games Coco Sharp, you'll find here, is it on the... Yeah, if you look here, you'll find this, and this is on the Microsoft site because Microsoft owns Xamarin now. Anyway, you'll find here the video basically takes you through the bouncing ball game. So that's quite cool watching that, but you probably skip the first 10 minutes or so. So this is what we're going to be looking at, the, the bouncing game. All of this has downloadable code. So this is what we're going to produce, but I'm going to probably try and take it a few steps further to try and get the idea of the kind of Arkanoid bouncy ball with the boxes on. But this is pretty straightforward to do and it will just get us used to some of the elements that we need to understand in order to build our game up. Once we've done this and got this to a decent state, I probably won't finish it. We'll then look at some other things like a tiled map, a tile editor, how we scroll the map uh, and other elements like menus and sound effects and all the rest of it. But I think once we get through the first few videos and you get comfortable understanding how these elements will build up, then you'll start to feel that it isn't such a massive minefield. And then you should be able to start kind of expanding it, start doing some of your own graphics and start kind of thinking a little bit more about how you want to play your game. So that's